Dr. Ertz is the piano instructor at the Youth Performing Arts School in Louisville and a lecturer in musicology at the University of Louisville. Um, I first met Dr. Ertz a couple years ago on a recruiting trip to YCAS, and um, I'm so glad that she's able to be here. She's wonderful to talk to and share ideas, and I can't wait to hear her presentation today. So welcome, Dr. Ertz. Loudly, I have a natural teaching voice, which is a little louder. So, um, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Van Dyke and Dr. Pavey. Um, our presentations, we should just take them on the road, I think, together. They dovetail together so excellently, and I'm very excited to use your materials. So, thank you so much for that. And thank you, Dr. Van Dyke, for having me. Um, I've been doing this kind of thinking for a long time. This is actually the first time I have presented, though, the marriage of the three things that I'm actually good at. So I obviously play the piano and harpsichord, and I teach in both capacities. But I'm also a published musicologist who studies music and dance. I still dance. Um, and so it kind of takes the three things, the piano, the harpsichord, and the musicology, and puts them all together. So um, I appreciate you going along on this ride for me. And I hope you find it useful, and I hope that I don't overwhelm you with too much information. I would like to give a presentation today that is a little bit more interactive, if that's okay. I might ask you to just respond to what you're hearing in the videos. Um, it's kind of naturally how I am. Is, is that going to work for the you know, streaming session? I'll repeat any answers that come at me from the audience for the people watching outside of this room. Are we good for that? Yeah. Excellent. All right, so it's a huge uh, mouthful of a title, Implications of Baroque Dance and Harpsichord Performance Practice for the Interpretation of Baroque Keyboard Works at the Piano. I can completely and entirely agree that students studying this repertoire need to hear the instruments, touch the instruments, but in reality, when they go to perform these works, they're going to probably be performing them on the piano. That doesn't mean we give up and just give ourselves over to a completely romantic performance style, though there's nothing wrong with that as a choice, as long as you make the choice consciously. But I do think there's so much that can be learned from looking at dance. Dance is the heart of Baroque music. Yes, there are many genres that don't utilize dance, you know, specifically certain sacred music genres, but dance is everywhere in Baroque music. So the things that I talked to you about today can be applied to preludes by Bach, um, to music that's just marked allegro, andante. So definitely think beyond the box here. Ha ha ha. All right, but let's start with the man who professionalized dance, or I should say boy. Um, in this picture, I believe that Louis XIV is either 13 or 14 when he danced the role of Apollo, the sun god, in the Ballet Royal de la Nuit. Um, he may look very fancy, he may look to be harmless, but in fact, dance was a powerful tool of propaganda. Um, much like certain politicians employ various means, including social media today, to dominate their audiences, Louis XIV used music and dance. He started an orchestra and a dance school, and he danced himself. He basically trapped people in Versailles overnight, and they had to witness his grand spectacles. So um, in this, you can see that not only is we, we have kind of a unification of suns all over his body in the costume and decor, but it's also quite extravagant. So on the one hand, it's a unified, thematically unified costume, like much Baroque dance music is going to have similar repetitive rhythms but it's very extravagant. The extravagance is much like the ornaments of Baroque music, right? The improvisational aspect. And the dance, too, is going to have elements of control and unification, particularly in the way that the body is used in the torso, and then extravagance in the arms and in the feet, in the extremities, right? So I think the three things can already be explored by just looking at this one image of Louis XIV. There's a lot on this slide. Um, I just didn't, couldn't you know, resist giving you just a crash course. So 
um, the court ballet is what we're really thinking of, but I do want you to think about social dancing in general because in all the way down to country dances that kind of filtered their way up into the aristocracy, people were dancing, okay? Um, and so since Louis XIII, we really had already had court ballet, but we just didn't have as much professionalization and participation by um, all kinds of people, so professional dancers and the king himself, right? Um, so the Ballet du Cour is a musical dramatic work, kind of like opera or musicals of today, um, staged with costumes and scenery. Um, and we have professional dancers alongside those at court. Obviously, the best roles go to the most powerful figures. Um, and they had a lot of different kinds of music in them, singing, choruses, and instrumental dances. And I already have talked about Louis XIV dancing at the age of 13. Um, he danced in several ballets, and dancing was part of political control. Um, it really is much more than just steps and drama. It was a way of comporting oneself at court. If you were successful in knowing the mannerisms, well, let's just say it plainly, it was a method of gatekeeping, right? If you wanted to succeed at court, even Elizabeth Claude, Jacquette de la Guerre, and those who were in her sphere had to know and follow precisely certain rules of etiquette. So dancing was actually part of that etiquette training. Um, and you know, I have a couple compelling sentences down here under dance and political control. If you know the rules and you execute them well, then you are showing the model of discipline, order, refinement, and restraint. And you'll see this in the videos. This is food for thought when you look at the historical dancers that are reenacting in, uh, Baroque dances. Um, and it's also the subordination of the individual. So even when you look at modern day ballet, this you, if you look at the classic works that come to us when people think of ballet, Nutcracker, Swan Lake, um, you know, you'll see that the court of the ballet has an aesthetic where they all have to match, they all have to dance at the same time. Even the prima ballerina, she might seem to be an individual, but she has only gotten there because she rose up through very stiff ranks of hierarchies. So we really have um, continued many of the things that were started in the court of Louis XIV. Enough of the musicologist part. Let's just take a look at dance notation. So we're so lucky to have these dances notated in such a precise and frankly beautiful way. When you look at this notation, I wanna ask you the first question of my presentation. You, I, unless I have a Fouillet scholar out here, what do you see in this as just an image or an illustration? Symmetry. Yes, good. What else? Symmetry was the answer. Separation. Yes, it seems like, like we sort of have two lines that go up in the middle and then they swirl, but along those lines, which by the way are the paths of the dancer, are all of these ornate little notations. And even their, the nature of the notation shows some kind of decorum. Anything else? It's okay. Um, symmetry and ornate kind of uh, ornamentation are like the main things. There's balance in here. Now that I've told you that the dancers will follow the steps, follow the path that starts at the bottom and then go up and go around, you'll see that they utilize the full space and that they do um, dance in a symmetrical path and they do nearly identical steps at the same time, but perhaps at some points one dancer will move to one side and the other. So sometimes it's a mirror opposite. And this isn't true of all Baroque dancing, but as an example of the aesthetic qualities, we can already think to ourselves about forms of Baroque dance music, the binary form, the rounded binary form, the um, ability for composers to really take us harmonically through balanced phrases one after the other with a lot of ornamentation, of course. So these are, I mean, they're kind of basic things, but I think, you know, anybody playing any instrument should have this kind of idea in their head. I don't know that I need to talk very much about harpsichord basics because Dr. Pavey gave us an excellent presentation on the things to consider when bringing the harpsichord to your students. Um, so I'll just remind you that the harpsichord was an instrument of the wealthy and the nobility. Um, the French harpsichords, of which this is a, is a model, 
were large double manuals. I believe somebody asked about the two manuals, so we already have a demonstration of that, the different sounds that are very subtle to today's ears, but like I will just say that if we did not have the noise of electric lights and machines humming and things in our pockets buzzing, that our ears would hear the sounds, the subtle gradations of tone and the combinations of notes on the harpsichord as much more intense than I think we do in current society. So it takes some focus and a meditative state to almost hear these things, but that's what I think draws in people like Dr. Fabian and myself to playing the instrument. Um, so the, there were all kinds of harpsichords. The French double manual harpsichord is just one. Um, and you can explore these. I have a few videos that I will skip because Dr. Pavey's presentation really covered the mechanics of the harpsichord and the make of the harpsichord. Um, but to just remind you that there is a distinct attack when the plectrum moves up and comes into contact with the string. It doesn't just initiate sound, it makes a clicking noise. And likewise, when it comes down and it escapes, it, it, there is a spring inside, so it doesn't repluck the string. It's also angled in a specific way that it's gonna pluck on the way up. Think about taking your fingernail, and then when you come back down, you might miss it altogether. So a pluck like this as opposed to a light brush. So it actually escapes, and it doesn't repluck the string, but on that passage down, it not only cuts off the sound, but there's another smaller sound, the end of the note, which I love. The end of the note is very important to me. Um, and the sound, therefore, is articulated at the start and the finish, which is not something we have really on the piano um, in the exact same way. And the decay is very quick on the harpsichord compared to pianos, but that doesn't mean that the sound goes away altogether. It just has a quick delay. In fact, I should have inserted a waveform in this, you know, next time I will insert this. So as you already know, weight or speed of attack does not create a louder or softer pluck. However, as was already explained, that does not mean there are no dynamics on the harpsichord. So I will be more blatant in my disregard for anyone who says it's not a dynamic instrument um, as like a way of kind of devaluing it in comparison to the piano. Um, so the final thing is, if you have a chance to come up onto the stage, you'll see that this instrument is in fact um, a really wonderful example of how harpsichords are valued as pieces of art. There is um, inside of this harpsichord a uh, lovely, I'm hoping it was some local artist, has done a floral design. Sometimes the famous painters of the day would actually decorate the whole inside, so when it was opened, you would see just really great Flemish school of painting, you know. So the, the, ar the harpsichord was not always just a utilitarian instrument. Well, French harpsichords, Flemish harpsichords. The Italian harpsichords and German harpsichords were maybe less beautiful to look at. So, but it was valued beyond just its ability to make sound. It was an item to show off in your home, in your palace, and an item that was, you know, really evidence of your refinement. Right, so we're gonna skip these because you've already heard some excellent demonstrations. Um, so, just to really harp on this point for a second, composers and performers have already created, the composers have already created the dynamics in the piece, and then the performer can choose ways to perform this music that accentuate those dynamics. So, these are pretty basic, but more notes versus less notes, we're gonna have a bigger sound with more. If we have more dissonance, it might seem to be a bigger sound than if we resolve that dissonance. If we roll a chord versus attack it all at once, again, it just might seem louder. The rolled chord fills up the space and the time, even if it's not actually louder. So there's a lot of oral illusion that goes on in harpsichord playing. Holding versus, and letting the sound decay versus letting go sooner. Um, ornamenting a note versus playing it plainly using full stops versus lute stop, and all of the variations in between. I might just quickly demonstrate some of these things. Is there a desire for that? Okay. I don't really have musical examples prepared for that, so um, it'll just be more like, here is a big G, G major chord on the front eight, and here it is coupled. 
here it is on the back eight. Flute stop. No. Hold on. As opposed to, now you've heard all the stops of this particular instrument, and I rolled those chords, but if I do this, it's done and over with, so that's a very different, you might be given that chord in the beginning of your piece, and you, as a performer, if you decide to roll it, it has a different dynamic effect, of course, in relation to everything that happens around that. Okay, so um, here's a basic G major chord without that many notes. Um... Now, when we do some of the ornaments that were shown in the ornament table earlier, we're actually adding dissonance. So... You hear it like those sevenths and seconds and suspensions. They're part of ornamenting the music, even though we think of them as harmonies. And, you know, there's a lot of argument about how, whether you hold the note. And, but I definitely add those to the pieces that I play on the harpsichord because it creates more sound. Um, rolling the chord and attacking all at once. Um, here we have, oh, that one doesn't work, sorry, hold on. Un... It's not my harp's chord. So... This is a way of making that G that's at the top of the chord really draw attention to itself as a melody note and prolonging it. So ornaments really accomplish a lot in terms of dynamics. Um, and then full stops, I already kind of showed you. I didn't do everything in order there, but um, just to take, perhaps, I'll, I'll play a little bit more of this later, but there's the opening of that very famous Handel Chacon that Sarabond that then has variations in D minor that's often in the literature that you're teaching to intermediate students. It's this one, you've heard it before. And I'm going to play it very plainly, and I'm not going to do anything cool with it. It's just going to be as written on the page. Here we go. <laughs> Oh no, I should, like I already did something. Didn't I? All right, let's try that again. Okay, we're all smarter than this, right? So on the piano, you don't want to do that either. I'm not going to demonstrate because we are here to hear beautiful music, but already, I'm going to tell you things later in this presentation that will help you make decisions that relate to what's on this slide about how you might approach this very kind of basic chord progression that is the beginning of a set of variations in a way that makes it not only more beautiful and pleasing for us all to hear, but that is inspired and informed by actual sarabands that are danced. How's that sound? Pretty cool, right? All right. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, so when we watch these videos, let's be active about it and listen for specific things. Repeating rhythmic patterns, the meter, and the tempo. These are very basic elements, but if you go and sit down and play a minuet, like, you know, you just had five shots of espresso, people aren't going to be able to dance to that. So that might be fun for the virtuosic among us but it is not inspired by a Baroque dance aesthetic. Um, and so we also might pay attention to how the elements of repeating rhythmic patterns and meter and tempo are reflected in the dance. In other words, are they exactly reflected or does the dance go somewhat in counterpoint with the very kinds of musical elements that we hear? And I already kind of hinted at parts of the body that are expressive and parts that are controlled, but in particular, keep your eye on both the hands and the feet, the parts that are expressive. And then, you know, don't discount the overall effort at these dancers to recreate Baroque costume and comportment. Just as a reminder, somebody took an actual costume, not costume, but like the garments worn by nobility by female nobility from this time period and put them on a scale and they weighed 40 pounds. So, you know, there's a reason that they're not doing a grand jeté, right? Like, th this is, 
you know, now something that's associated with Baryshnikov, but there's a reason that the women were <laughs> just doing this was like a whole workout. Do it. I mean, you know, 40 pounds. So um, I think costume is an important part of the aesthetic and in very practical ways as well as aesthetic ways. All right, so here we go. I have several videos. I'm very excited about this. See how much time we have. Okay, so we're going to watch. Uh, this is from a series that I'm not always a huge fan of, but for the minuet, it's great. It's um, How to Dance Through Time, and hopefully it's loud enough. Here we go. Audience, dearest audience, it, what is the meter of this dance? Three. Good. Just got to get that out of the way. And um, is it a fast or a slow dance, or is it relatively medium? I'm thinking medium. Yeah. And are there any repeating rhythmic patterns? Of course, we are just hearing a violinist, so it's, so it's kind of like a rehearsal situation. Yeah, I mean, a steady stream of quarter notes with a few eighth notes in there, yeah? The violinist is actually doing a really nice job. Again, if the violinist were to just play the notes on the page, it would be da 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 right? And they are already showing us something about the dance, the meter of the dance, the feel of the dance. So now let's turn to what the dancers are actually doing. Do we see a step on every single quarter and eighth note? No, not at all. In fact, we see a very subtle, I mean, it might actually be very difficult to see it from out there, but there are balances and there's little steps, okay? The little steps are actually quicker in some ways than the quarter notes that we're hearing in the violin part. Um, we can see that there's an importance to the pattern that they break away and come back together. So that might relate to your phrasing. Um, I want to show another video before we really examine this on the harpsichord. I think this is just an example to show you how a group would dance the minuet, and you're not going to be able to see feet as well, but it gives you another. Let's just watch it. <laughs> accentuation of the meter and I see some bigger movements on the one, for example, a kick on the one and then a hold. Um, you're going to see in my third video the way that dancers actually phrase the minuet, um, but this is an excellent, excellent video showing the symmetry and it also shows the male costume, which very much valued seeing the leg. Louis XIV was, um, was fabled to have brought the high heel into the men's attire because it shows off your calf muscle when you wear a high heel. Um, so you can investigate that legend on your own, but you can see that this is a part of the aesthetic and the comportment that we want to see, this kind of nice, nicely shaped calf. I gotta keep it fun somehow, right? So here is an explanation of the minuet phrase for the dancers. The minuet, like the courant, has its own characteristic step units, such as the minuet step of two movements as described by Rameau. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. The fact that these minuet steps take up six beats 
has implications for the musician playing minuets written in 3-4 or 3-8. It is helpful to think of the music measures in pairs, with the first measure having a strong beat and the second measure having a less strong beat. and Thomas Baird are just fabulous for the study of Baroque dance and there's not much on YouTube. I'm lucky to have found this. I own the DVD. Um, I know that seems like ancient technology, but if you're wanting to share something with your students, it's worth um, in investing in because she actually talks about how the musician would interpret this dance. So let's go over as a summary, medium tempo, Dancers must be able to step elegantly. So you cannot take it too slow or too fast. Articulate the meter, long, shorter, shortest. I'm going to demonstrate this in a moment. And, but also remember that the dancers are feeling a six bar phrase as opposed to one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And there's an extra lift on six. You can see that there's actually kind of pause in this position on that beat which gives us a, a moment. We don't want to fill that up with too much, you know, junk as a performer. Um, so, and then it's really going to be nice for everyone listening if you're still phrasing. So let's take some very basic Bach minuets and a, one from Elizabeth Claude, Jaquette de la Guerre, because it has so many ornaments. I want to show you how the ornaments are affected by these concepts. So here we go. basic Bach ones. I had some more elaborate things planned, but um, you all know these, so let's take the ones that we know. So first thing is, this is already embodied in Bach's even most basic Anna Magdalena notebook music, whether it's written by Bach or not. Um, I shouldn't say it is. These are Petzold pieces, according to the latest research. But you hear one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And then you hear it again. We don't have a steady stream of quarter notes in the left hand, but we want to, whenever we do have that, to give a long, shorter, shortest. And you can hear it here. Right? I'm in fact slurring. This is often indicated in the editions that give you slurs, though I think you should avoid those with your students because then you can find the solution together. Okay? It's not, right? There's a difference. Um, so even, it, you know, this, this six beat motion of the dancers is embodied in the music, but how you approach it also can, you know, destroy that or kind of uplift it. On the piano, what do you do? suggesting and I think it's a world of difference but it's not as simple as just saying okay these notes are slurred and these are staccato because you could say that to a student and you say oh it's in a, it's a dance in three so please give me an accent on the first beat and show us the meter and so then they do this <laughs> exaggerations for comic effect so you know I think that this graceful thing isn't something that you just demonstrate and you say, just do that, you know? I mean, we do a lot of teaching where we demonstrate and we expect some kind of rote element, but explaining how on the harpsichord that is the only means of creating dynamics then takes away the desire to play like a drummer and instead to play like a French Baroque dancer. Saying, then you
then you can have them really also ornament. Okay, um, Elizabeth Claude Jaquette de la Guerre wrote a beautiful but not too hard to play minuet in A minor from the A minor suite that I believe we heard a section of before. So let me just pull that up and play for you. I'll just play it. I'm sorry. You can hear that approach. I may not be perfect at it, but that long, shorter, shortest, which gives us, this harpsichord's not giving me a wonderful short, but it gives you the lift that we need. And again, embodied in this music is that six beat phrase already, but I can choose to minimize the lift on the third beat of the first measure and maximize it on the sixth beat. But I have a lot of ornaments to deal with too, so how am I going to manage? So here it is unadorned, um, just the right hand. Notice I did give it the feel. I did my best job I could. But I have the ornaments. I don't want to lose that feel just because I'm being challenged by those ornaments. So if an ornament's on beat two, you don't have to worry too much. Beat one, you can really just hold the end of it. Like a mordant, it can be, hold it until you get to beat two, right? Um, but if an ornament is on beat three, you have to accomplish that ornament and still give us the lift. So you get this. that that did a good job demonstrating the, the kind of release of the note, the ornamented note. It's not just an ornament. You can think about the length of the note, the articulation. In particular, that little click that you hear when a note ends on the harpsichord. So let's take this over to the piano. Not everything that is done on the harpsichord sounds good on the piano, caveat. We all know this, but we can be inspired. And by the way, in my music, I have the long, shorter, shortest marked, and I have the, the six-bar phrase marked, and I also have a larger umbrella. It looks like an umbrella, and I should have taken a screenshot of this to put on my slideshow, but I ran out of time. It's a way of reminding my students who play this music is I have the luxury of a harpsichord right in my room and I force them all to play it. So I am enacting uh, Dr. Pavey's agenda in my own practice, but it's because I have the privilege and we don't all have that. So, um, you know, I really do want to make a nice phrase and I won't play it again, but I think that I tried to accomplish uh, still having a nice four bar phrase on the piano. I'm not going to ignore the ability of the piano to give us a nice gesture. I'm not going to go, you know, give it some direction, give it some line. You can do that at the same time as, you know, providing an articulation plan that really gives us the dance. Now, I won't go into as much depth with all of the rest of my examples, but I think this is the minuet is a perfect place to start. Because the minuet, first of all, lasts into the classical period, and the littlest students play the minuet all the way up to very fancy minuets that you can play in the French harpsichord music. This Elizabeth Claude Jaquette de la Guerre selection is not that difficult and it's a great introduction to the ornament, you know, the mordant and the trill. So I highly recommend it. It has an ABA format. They're not going to struggle to like just get their hands on the notes. Moving on. The Allemande. Let's watch.
arms are interlacing in this really intricate way. And then tell me about the other part of the body that's moving. The feet. The feet. So the arms do not articulate the rhythm, right? They are closed. The feet we have in this particular accompaniment, which is ubiquitous in all the alamans on Mule 2, for some reason, a very steady feel of dupe or of one and two and three and four and, but the feet are even going maybe a little faster sometimes. Lots of little steps. So for the dancers, there's a real challenge here of coordinating this nice fluid slow movement, which is actually quite intimate, and that's why the dance became you know, so popular at court with these little fe feet movement. So how does this square then? I wanted to play an instrumental. You'll hear this group another time. Sorry, got to move on. Um, so it just wants to play on its own. Um, so how does this square with our interpretation of Alamans at the keyboard? First of all, German folk dance. I put folk into um, a you know, quotation situation because I do not want to replicate this high art versus low art thing. There's a lot of interchange in between and Alamans are just German dances. So anyway, I'm gonna leave it at that for now, but you can you know, come to my musicology lectures for talking about other aspects like appropriation and class. So usually in 4-4 and a steady stream of notes in the piece. The arms are interlaced and the beats and subdivisions are marked by the feet with many small steps. The articulation of the feel of four then is really important and it should remain very steady for the dancers. A stylized French keyboard allemande on the one hand is going to be a good example of using notes in a gall, but notes in a gall which swing the notes like the first one is a little longer than the second one doesn't mean it's not steady. So, um, and then of course you want to feel the overall timing of the phrases because the dancers need that to know when to complete a single kind of pass through of the arms and move on to the next section of the dance. So I'm going to attempt to play for you a little bit of an allemande by Elizabeth Claude Jacquette de la Guerre on the harpsichord and then on the piano, but this is a piece I play on the harpsichord, so wish me luck. Um, and to show you some of the things that you can do with this. It's a pretty straightforward thing, but I think the number one thing is marking the feel of one and two and three and four and, and that again relates to the use of the left hand. Um, so let's try this. And this is the Flemish from her suite in D minor. I'm gonna play it a little slower so that I can be accurate and also so that you can hear some of the left hand things that give the sense a steady feel of four um, without too much of an accent. Like, I mean, there is a little bit of an accent on one, but I'm not gonna do the same thing I did with the minuet where it's like a one, two, three, four, five, six, one. Like, that's not a feature of this. All right. <laughs> With apologies, that had notes in a gall in it, and I'm going to play that same passage again without the notes in a gall, but I'm going to continue to do a slurring that and a kind of a lift that shows you each beat. Um, to break it down, I'm doing this instead of. I can't, on this harpsichord, I can't reach my normal 10th, which is always a stretch for me anyway, so I apologize for the wrong note, but it goes. Okay, so that left hand is really showing you by often slurring the two eighths together. One, two, and three, and four, and, right? And then the notes in a gall give um, a little bit of a swing feel added on top, and it's mostly the right hand that's doing that because they're applied to the 16th notes. 
I'm going to play the same passage without notes in a gall, just so you can hear the two versions. They're both very steady, and they both accent the very even four-beat nature of the Allemande. I did hit the tenth that time. I'm feeling all proud of myself. And you could hear on the sixteenth notes that, you know, you don't, instead of having, you have. So it, it, the dancers are going to be able to dance to either version. The only other thing that I'd like to point out about this piece is that it has a lot of counterpoint in it where you can really hear in relation to Dr. Pavey's lecture that the, the um, two, the soprano and the tenor voice have this imitative line um, in this, this section here. love that about these dances. Sorry, total aside. Um, so this isn't necessarily like the literature that you're giving your students, but they will play an allemande at some point. And so I uh, don't know that I want to attempt to do the Bach allemande from the French suite number four that has the steady stream of eighth notes in it. Um, well, forgive me if I really stink at this, but I'll play a little bit of this on the piano. Again, this is not a piece I play on the piano, so... Um, but I think it can work. And then I'll try the French suite. articulation practices, but also I can do more with phrasing, but I'm subtle about it. I'm not going to take it from pianissimo to fortissimo and use a lot of rubato. I could demonstrate that for you. I love doing that for my students, but I'll spare you. Um, so the French suite by Bach that people usually play, this one... Students usually learn this with a legato fingering, and I think that's actually a very good way to learn the piece because then you have to be intentional with your choices to not play legato, and, and you'll have both available to you, which is even better, right, than choosing a finger that goes thumb, 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 thumb. But I think we can do some things that are a little bit unconventional with this allemande if we think about those dancers going do 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 right? So, how might we experiment, even if we decide we're going to go with the romantic version because it's so gorgeous and why not, at least try it out. Sorry. not something you do the first time through, but you certainly could think about doing it on the repeat. How cool would that be? And you can bring out other aspects. I'm sure you all know this if you teach this allemande, but you can add a little finger pedal and bring out like this, this line that you have in the right hand. And you can do that on the harpsichord too if you articulate. So it's not necessarily about accenting the note and then holding it, it's about the lift that comes before. And it's a very tricky thing to do. I am not playing a full legato for this piece. I'll break it down. Instead of, I think you can hear the difference. Please shake your head, yes, okay. So um, that 
it's just something to experiment with. I have warned that you don't want to take any of these things and just do them the whole time like a blanket thing because that'll just get as, just as annoying as full on legato with pedal down, right? So, but being a little bit tasteful and thinking about the articulation aspect and the way that the dancers might, this might actually represent all those little steps. At the same time, we have this stake, snaking line of the phrase that is the arms of the dancers. So anyway, this is the stuff that makes me think, um, you know, about these pieces rather deeply and I love it. I'd love to be this way. Um, so you can come along or not. Um, we are going to, I thought I set a timer and I'm not sure what happened to it. So I have a courant Sarabande and Gigue. I think that for the sake of time that we may have um, like maybe 10, five minutes, 10 minutes left. Well, no, because we will be here until, I'll keep you here like Louis the 14th, you'll be trapped. So, um, but I will try to speed things up because I would really like to have you challenge me with your questions. It's actually the, the only thing better than bringing my thoughts to you is hearing your reaction and having you challenge me. So let's watch a courant. <laughs> change from the Renaissance to the Baroque. So we hear a very quick three in this. And I am not entirely sure that it has a real relationship to the keyboard courants, but there is a danced courant that does have a relationship to the keyboard courant. You can see though that this is a group dance from the Renaissance, um, like the Pavan and Galliard, which I'm, maybe you're familiar with. And it's kind of like a contra dance with a set pattern of couples interchanging and doing things. But it's a really excellent example of a feel of three, that, which is plain and unadorned. And it is not what happens in the Baroque courant. The Baroque courant is the most tricky, I think. Maybe Dr. Pavey agrees. There, there's so much going on rhythmically in the courant. So let's watch this couple. I think that this video has an overdub of somebody explaining the steps, so I think that that's really interesting, and maybe you'll have some comments about how the steps align or do not align with the music, so I'll be asking that. Pas porté, un chassé coulant. Ton en ronde, chassé sideways and retirade. which was a movement derived from fencing exhibitions. Retirade. Pas tombé. Do the dancers show either of those metrical senses, do you think? One, two, or none of the above? Like, it's hard to know. I think that's why the courant has a mixture of a feel of three and a feel of duple, which we call hemiola. Because the dancers have many points where the music will keep going in this video and they might pause and balance. And then there's movement, and then there's a pause. So this mixture of movement and stillness on the dancers is reflected in the kind of squishy nature of the metrical feel. Let's like watch just a little bit more. I 
should do what I do with my college students, which is have them watch the dance video without any music going and have them guess like what the meter is, what the instrumentation is, like all of that. Because this one is really tricky. Um, the other thing is, I think she might have said this, but there's a move in here that, which is derived from fencing. So just to um, drive home the thought that a lot of these dances come from etiquette and from other acts of court life, including fencing. Um, so let's just talk about the courant, and maybe I won't have time to play one. Darn. Um, I do have one planned, though. The French courant and the Italian courant are different dances. It's in a stately three, but often can contain a shift in emphasis, and any good French courant has that. Um, a six-eight feel or a feel of hemiola. So one and two and three and one and a two and a one and two and three and and it's usually pretty obvious in the placement of stronger and weaker aspects of the, of the harpsichord ornaments, groupings of notes. Um, and sometimes even your right and your left hand will have options. Like the left hand might clearly be in three, but the right hand might have more of a duple feel. So that is super fun and challenging. Um, they have, because they're so French, you could use notes in a gal, which is that swing feel, in a courant if you want, and still maintain the metrical feel that you've chosen. And obviously, the one thing that the dancers do is they come down to that cadence with a nice, beautiful, turned out plie, and the, the band comes together and goes boom, 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 pause, and then we start again. So that is really important that you get that right. You don't want to hammer that and have that be a point of arrival in a big way, it's the elegant closure. Just like dancers, they don't go, and I'm here, they go, right? So the, the phrasing on the piano or keyboard should really represent that feel. Okay, um, I was going to demonstrate from De La Guerre, but I will leave that to the true diehards that stay with me at the end during the question period. Um, because I have a really excellent example of the two versus three feel and how you might manage that. And it is, just trust me, totally possible to do this on both the piano and the harpsichord. I think I've kind of demonstrated that it is possible at this point. So sarabande, my most favorite. But this is a guilty pleasure. The sarabande is still hotly contested in musicology. It is a dance that was appropriated, we think, from the colonization of Latin America, where it was supposed to be a street dance, of course, taken from maybe the most marginalized of the communities that were brutalized, and then brought back to France and Portugal and Spain. And all of the kind of contemporary accounts equate the Sarabande to women and pleasure and bad things at the same time as it becomes a hot dance for the court, but of course it goes from being this raucous, fast dance to a very stately and slow three, right? For the most stately among us. And let's just watch this really gorgeous solo performance from Il Giardino Armonico, one of my most favorites. <laughs> has a very obvious something that counteracts this feel of three. It is not a minuet. It's not going one, two, three, four, five, six, right? It's going yum, brum. And this dancer, is, this is the best video because he's like this, right? He really shows off on that second beat and prolongs it as long as he can before moving to the third. And I just, it's fabulous. 
So I've already said most of what I needed to say that's on this slide, and I'd like to maybe just end my presentation with a little bit of Sarah bonding on both instruments. And um, I think that's all we have time for. So instead of just accenting the second beat, I think it's important to lift before it. You want to round out groups of two measures while still aiming for longer phrases. It's something I've said all along. And because of the slow tempo, which I think can be debated, there is a lot of room for improvisation. So, a saraban by Elizabeth Claude Jaquette Felagueo from her Sweet and B minor. I know, he really wanted that handle one that I played earlier. Maybe I'll just, that one kind of goes like this. Okay. Now, usually I do go to the lute. Basically, I took that whole opening chordal texture and turned it into steel brise and really tried to show a six beat um, conception of the two plus two phrases. The same can be done on the piano. to get to everything and I have delusions of grandeur pretty often about like whole suites you know courant saraban alaman courant saraban gig which by the way is really just scratching the surface and is uh, this you know misconception that that's what the suite is um, you can select you can expand you can contract you can take these pieces and play them on their own I hope you will I hope you'll think about articulation I hope you'll think about jigs because they're the hottest dance with lots of skips and jumps. But my conclusions are, please watch Baroque dancers. Why not? It's so much fun to watch dance. Try out some steps. You know, just do this for the G. Skip. Just doing that will get you to realize what your tempo possibilities are. Listen to harpsichords. Try out harpsichords if you can. Analyze your music. Use clean copies. Then you can dirty them up, like I do, with all of the things that you want to do. Um, plan your articulation and ornaments carefully, and your fingering should really be derived in conjunction with thinking about the ornaments and articulation. 
And finally, I hope this inspires you to be playful, to experiment, to improvise, to embellish, to do so with good historical information, um, and most importantly, to play some Elizabeth Claude Jaquette de la Guerre, right? Because there's stuff out there that even the, the youngest pianists can play. I have taken her entire oeuvre that is available on IMSLP and rated it all, and I hand these out regularly to my students, and I take them through all these steps. So I promise you that this is not just an intellectual exercise for musicologists. It's something that we could all do, and I thank you for your attention. Are there questions? typical like a uh, ballet technique balance which has this in it. One, da, da, ya, da, da, ya, da. So that big brush is their down and then they have their up, up. And if you want to make the second up a little bit different, you can even have a kind of pop to it. So there's your minuet. Um, I do teach my students 
how to do a basic waltz just outside of the third year of Baroque music. I do teach them the Sublime and Galliard or actual, like the nobility weren't doing all fancy dances yet. Like they were doing, you know, the Pagan is this. So everybody can do it. The Sambo, Sambo, Dalbo, Dubo, right? So Pagan and Galliard, uh, Galliard is this. So the Galliard is actually very helpful for teaching the Gig. It's kind of the same basic feel. Um, and if you teach them the Galliard, they will play their Gig too fast. The Galliard is oop, oop. adapt steps that are working in the same context, Renaissance Galliard for Jig. Um, I suppose that for the Pavan, it doesn't work well for um, Alamon. For Alamon, there's actually a lot of basic kind of pas de bourre, which is the stepping walk for historic contra dances, country, dance, country dancing in France and England and Italy and Germany. Instead of walking through the steps, you go, So there's actually a pause. You don't articulate all four of the 16th notes. You go one E and a two E and a. So you could hum that bop all along. Let me catch my breath. And you can see why I might want to play that all along without going. Me to think the lift helps the dancer know when their next little group happens. So a, a, a series of four leads per measure, and I'm going to get across the stage to the harpsichord, right? So I think this has all been videotaped, much to my embarrassment. You take it or leave it. It's not like I'm teaching them actual plie notated dances, but I do believe that it is derived from accurate information and it's helpful. Anything that a student does with their body, whether it be singing or moving their feet, instead of just playing, is going to help them feel in, in a more full way what needs to happen at the instrument. So a strong belief of mine. What else are your what other questions do you have? Go ahead. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. Um, I think this is especially useful for dance and anything that's dance derived. And so for Chopin waltzes and mazurkas and polonaises, absolutely. And I have my students undertake a similar project where they have to find videos and then they have to use sources about historic pianism to come up with a solution for how to play a mazurka. And I don't know, they're just high schoolers, but they go along with me. <laughs> I'm, like I said, I'm super privileged, but I do have some private students that I also force into this kind of. <laughs> they haven't left my studio yet. <laughs> Um, you know, I think you have, to, and you have to gauge your student's interest. I would not ever force a student to dance who didn't want to, you know. And um, I have worked on some Baroque uh, music at the piano, and the student tried all the things I asked and then ended up playing uh, the, the Rameau and the Couperon that we were working on in a much more romantic style. But to me, it was just important that they tried my articulation plan, and then when the student scrapped it, it was like, cool, man, that's fine. You do you. At least you're not doing you without other, having experimented with other options. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your attention. I really am honored by it, because I went way over. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>